Let's pray tonight over the word of the Lord. We're going to look at Revelation 17 and 18. And I'm continuing in this series on Babylon and the harlot church and all that. So, Father, we just thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, your presence that's here. But I thank you, Lord, for everything accomplished in and through this word that you will be done. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to us and giving us good soil as the parable of the seed and the sower that your word goes out as living seed sown into good soil watered by the holy spirit take root grow and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till jesus comes and the winds of your spirit cure this everywhere it needs to go we thank you that your word will not return void but go forward and accomplish that which you sent it forth to do and we take authority over the enemy because the birds of the air try to steal the seed anything that would try to hinder this word in any way we commit to be bound and back off right now in jesus name we break its power and i thank you lord for your angels just clearing all that away and there'll be freedom in jesus name we thank you for it and we believe that everything will be accomplished in it through this time that you will to be done in jesus name we pray amen all right so we've been looking at some end time prophecy and we're going to continue in that so tonight i'm going to focus on holiness and the fear of the lord and i'm going to get to that but up front i wanted to say something um it might be a little little bit concerning but i want you to really think about this so i encourage people if you don't already to make sure that you have some kind of a physical bible that that you can hold in your hands because a lot a lot of people now are just doing things online which there's not anything wrong with that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that in the days to come, before Jesus actually physically comes to the earth, I really do believe that it will become increasingly persecuted to have a Bible, even in America, eventually. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I'm not saying it's even in a couple years, but I, I do know the Bible predicts that before Jesus comes, there's going to be a tremendous amount of resistance against the word of the Lord. And I can just see in the days to come, how many can kind of see what I'm talking about, where this is going? I believe that Google and, uh, you know, right now you can Google the Bible. I believe one day that's not going to be available. And I believe that some of the apps that we use for Bible study won't be available. And I think that the Internet's really going to sanction against the Word of God uh, for a lot of reasons. But I think that the excuse will probably be that it's uh, kind of like hate speech or something and promotes violence or something like that, which is not obviously the exact opposite of the truth, but that's what they'll say because it's not pro-homosexuality and pro-things that they want it to be for, you see. So anyway, I just want to encourage people to get a really good Bible, look into it, research what Bible you would want. Uh, there's so many good choices out. There's a lot of good translations and get a really good Bible, be willing to spend some money on it, and get a good one that you'll have the rest of your life, and have something physically that you can have in your hand, as I believe we're going to need that in the days to come. Okay, so with that said, the Bible says that the end of the age is the harvest. Okay, so let me read this to you. All that has been sown into the human race from the time of Adam till the end. So picture humanity in over the 6,000 years from the time Adam fell to the when Jesus comes, okay? Picture it like a huge field. And all that's been sown in humanity, both good and evil, is going to come up to fruition, okay? So there's, I want you to think about this for a moment. Everything that's been sown, it's like seeds in the ground. And the Bible says that the end of the age is the harvest, and we've always thought of that as a harvest of souls, and that's true, but there's more to that revelation. See, even right after Adam fell, the very next generation with Cain and Abel, I want you to think about something. You had right there represented with Cain and Abel, you had the bride and then you had like the harlot right there, okay? So Cain represents like a work-based religion that had no grace it had no relationship whatsoever, and it produced a murderer, okay? So y'all hear me tonight. 
Cain and Abel, the very next generation after the fall of humanity, Cain represents like a harlot church, if you will, or a harlot bride, whatever, and Abel represents like the bride of Christ. And it's metaphoric, okay? But I want you to think about this. Cain was a work-based religion that had no real relationship, and it did not have any grace. It didn't have the blood of the lamb. It was just about earning your salvation and doing works that are expected to be accepted by God, but they weren't. And Abel, and so Cain's religion produced this harlot and it produced a murderer. Did y'all hear what I said? So Cain produced a murderer, that religious system, if you will. Now, Abel was focused on the blood of the lamb. Abel's religion, if you want to call it that, was very much a relationship based, it was grace. It was a covenant. It was right with God. And it was like the bride, and it produced a martyr. So where Cain's religion produced a murderer, Abel's religion produced a martyr. So think about this. That began right after the fall of man. I mean, it was the next generation. So from that time until Jesus actually comes physically to Israel, Everything that's been sown in humanity down through the ages, you have kind of like a serpent-like seed, if you will, in the earth that has been growing in darkness and evil and power through the generations and defilement. And, and then you have this, this seed. The Bible says that, remember when God spoke to Eve and, and Adam and he, and he said, listen, he said, he may, the serpent may strike your heel, but the seed of the woman will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. That seed, if you will, of the woman, that, that Messiah seed has also been there all along. And, and everybody that died before Christ came, they were looking for the Messiah to come, you see. So it's always been there. And so you have like everything that's been sown in humanity, both good and evil, are going to somehow come to fruition in the end and it's going to produce a very sincere, serious, remnant bride of Christ that's without spot or blemish, filled with extra oil, on fire for God, and that really have an intimate relationship. It's going to produce that in a good sense. And I think a lot of times the difficulties of the time are going to forge people. But also at the same time, it's going to produce some of the most wicked, evil generation, if you will, of human beings that has ever been on the planet. As a matter of fact, I can show you in the Bible where there's no interpreting this. It flat out says this, that eventually before Jesus comes, the entire world is going to worship the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. So it's, going, it's all going to come to a head, okay? It started with, with Cain and Abel, and it was like two different moves there there was a move of satan and a move of god and it was like a harlot type of religion that produced a murderer and then there was a uh, grace uh, relationship based type religion if you will that produced a martyr and you're going to see that come to fruition as well in the very end because you're going to see those that serve satan become increasingly violent and more murderous and bloodthirsty, but you're also going to see a lot more martyrdom of true believers before Jesus comes. In fact, in the book of Revelation, there's tr a tremendous amount of martyrdom. So is this making sense tonight? It's a little bit different angle, but it's, it's something that I can see that is going to come to full fruition, you see. All right, so Matthew 13, 36. Some of this might make a little bit more sense, but I want to look at Revelation 17 and 18, you just kind of read it. But if you look at Matthew 13, this is the famous parable Jesus taught of the, the wheat and the tares. Now, tares look exactly like wheat, but they're not. They're just a weed. They do not produce any grain, okay? 
So Jesus said, then they left the crowd and went into the house, and the disciples asked him, explain to us this parable of the weeds, which is the tares in the field. Because the parable was that the owner sowed wheat into the field, but yet an enemy came at night while everybody was sleeping and sowed tares in there. It was just weeds, and they both were growing up together. And the disciples didn't really understand the parable. So when they got Jesus alone, they said, could you explain this to us? And Jesus answered and said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, him. And the field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. In other words, God's true people. But the weeds, which were the tares, okay, the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy sows, the enemy who sows them is the devil. And the harvest, listen to this, the harvest is the end of the age, so it's all going to come to fruition at the end of the age. See, the Bible says thick darkness will come on the earth, but the glory upon his people. It's the same thing. You're going to see some of the thickest darkness that the world's ever seen descend, but you're also going to see the greatest glory in the church you've ever seen. Does that make sense? So it's, it's at the same time. And anyway, it says this, the harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. Now, don't forget that because that's an important revelation. The harvesters are the angels. For us to even see the harvest of souls, I believe in these latter days, we really are going to need angelic assistance to do so, to help push back the darkness and help gather in the sheaves, okay? And it says in verse 40, and the weeds, the tares, are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be when? At the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil, and they will throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has an ear, let him hear. So again, the, the Lord himself in the parable before this, the parable the owner said, well, don't try to pull up the tares because if you try to pull up the weeds, you may pull up some of the wheat with them. And sometimes uh, anybody that's, that knows a little bit about gardening and all, sometimes root systems can kind of start intertangling each other, you know. But he said, let the angels do it because they'll figure it out. They'll know how to separate the wheat and the tares. They'll know how because the angels can see things that we can't see many times Somebody looks really good, they look religious, they look like a Christian, but God knows their heart and they're not. And sometimes another person may outwardly be going through struggles and, and they have all kinds of problems they're trying to work through. And if you look at them on the surface, they don't look like a Christian, but they are. So you, that's why God said, just let my angels take care of this one. You'll mess it up. Amen. All right. So the true church versus a false church and then i'm going to look at revelation here in just a moment but all of this is going to come to a fullness and we're moving quickly into this time the bible says i've studied end time prophecy for decades i love it and but anyway the bible says this it says that when when you see all these things happening that generation will not pass away until it's finished so we're seeing, I believe, we're, we're seeing now all these things starting to happen the Bible said would happen. And I don't want to rabbit you on to some big, long thing. If I did, you would go, oh, I see what you mean. But just trust me, everything the Bible said would happen is, is starting to happen in every area, geopolitically, financially, the nations, Israel, everything. So we're seeing all of it. I believe the coming of the Lord is near. So... This, this whole study, though, is talking about the true church versus like a harlot, fake church. So what marks a true church? Number one, that we have the pure gospel being preached and we're living righteously in obedience to the scriptures. That's going to mark the true church. So it's the true gospel. It's not works-based. It's not surface level. It's not watered down. It's not apologizing for anything. It's the true pure gospel without any type of adding to it or taking away from it it is what it is presented without compromise no apologies pure gospel and then people living a righteous life as they obey the bible number two 
what's going to mark a true church? They're fully submitted to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because a lot of people are not necessarily submitted. How many knows that Jesus is supposed to be the head of the church? But I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of places have an attitude like, well, we've got this. Number three, what's going to mark the true church? They're going to love and they're going to honor the Bible. And the, there's a washing of the water of the word of God. So I always tell people, I've, I've you know, talked to young people and, and different groups about the Bible a lot through the years, and I've always taught people that this is not just another book. And don't just treat it like another book. You know, I don't ever use my Bible as some kind of a coaster or something disrespectful. I don't, I don't just throw it somewhere. And, or, you know, the, I treat it with respect because it's God's Word. Amen? So we love and we honor the Word of God. We respect it and treat it as such. But people that are going to be God's true people in these last days will have a real love for the Word. They're going to be studious of it. And there's a washing of the water of the word of God. As how many knows when you really read this sincerely, it's going to convict you. And then you're going to want your life to be washed by what you're reading, saying, okay, I need to repent of this. So there's a cleansing. And then what's the fourth thing that marks the true church? They will embrace the Holy Spirit, his gifts, and his power. And we're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in these last days. And then the last thing I would say is that a true church is going to be a bride without spot or blemish. So it's going to be like a bride. A bride is somebody that's looking for the Lord. So how many have seen somebody that's about to get married? They're excited about it. They're ready to get married, okay? There's going to be a group of people on the earth that are going to really be excited about the Lord. They're going to be excited about their relationship with him. They love him, and they're really looking for his coming. They really are. And those are the ones that are going to be the true bride that the Lord's coming for. So the true church, now what marks a false church in these last days? And remember, Cain looked religious because he was bringing an offering to God. It was just the wrong offering. So Cain was religious, but he was not right with God, okay? So what's this false church? We know the world is the world. I'm talking about like a harlot church, a false church, a fake form of Christianity that's going to emerge and is already emerging right now. What is going to be this false church? Here's some things that you can look for. Number one, they do not embrace the pure gospel. They will have a view that's very tolerant, meaning they will really think, even though they may not say things a certain way because they'll know how to say things that sound right, but they will really sincerely think to themselves that there's actually many roads that lead to God. And it'll be very ecumenical, meaning it will connect with other religions. And all of it will kind of merge into this weird thing. And see... The one world religion that's coming is really going to just be a hodgepodge of all these different beliefs and religions, and all of them will be tolerated. All of them will come together except for one, true Christianity. They will be hated and persecuted by these others. But in this hodgepodge of religions and all this that's going to align itself with a false prophet, there's going to be a group in there that calls themselves Christians. But like Cain... They're not really God's people. They look religious, they act religious, but they're not, they don't know the Lord. They do not embrace the true, pure gospel, which is this. It's very exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way. That's it. There's no other way to heaven but through the cross. And that is very exclusive. And these people, will li they will not live a pure, holy life. Their lifestyle will be such that they will be very worldly. I would add to that also, number two, that they will not require a new birth. They're comfortable with people that are not born again. Because, see, the wheat and the tares, the tares look just like wheat until it gets to the harvest time, and the wheat will produce grain at the top. That's the only difference. The only difference between wheat and tares is that tares are worthless because they don't produce any grain. So 
The difference, though, if you want to look at it this way, is DNA. The wheat has one DNA and the tare has another DNA. They look the same outwardly, but they're not the same. See, those of us that are truly born of God, we have a different nature. Spiritually speaking, we have a different DNA. We are born again. But those that are just religious and they're not born again, they may look good outwardly, but they're not the Lord's. So it's tares and wheat, okay? Number three, those that are a false church, they will not adhere to the Bible as the infallible word of God. Number four, they will not require repentance of sin and holy living. They won't. Number five, they do not embrace the personal work of the Holy Spirit. Number six, they will be very worldly and very liberal. And finally, number seven, uh, actually there's one more after. Number seven, they have a form of godliness, like a form of religion, but they deny the power of God. So they have a form of religion about them. And finally, producing, this will all produce an unfaithful, spiritually filthy harlot. Did y'all hear me? This will produce a harlot church. All right, so I'm going to look at Revelation 17 and 18, I'm using the Amplify. There's some things in here I think will be good. And then once we get through that, I just want to close out with a little bit about the holiness of God, the fear of the Lord and holiness, okay? But Revelation 17 and 18, I know that our church has gone through a lot of um, end-time prophecy teaching. We did the Spine of Prophecy series and then we went through the book of Revelation together. So I feel like you guys have a pretty good grasp on prophecy. But I'm just going to read Revelation 17 and 18 and explain it as I go, okay? But this is talking about, in Revelation 17 and 18, this is talking about this harvest, this evil harlot church emerging, okay? And so this is the way the Bible describes this. And you can see this here in 17 18 real clear. And we might look at a few other places. But this is the doom of Babylon. So what is Babylon in the Bible? So in the book of Revelation, Babylon is this. It is the end time antichrist system that's in place in the world that will persecute Christians, that will follow the antichrist as a geopolitical leader, okay, and will follow the false prophet who is like the geo-religious leader. But it's a system that's both religious and political together that will form a really powerful force. I mean, it's going to be a powerful, strong force of Satan in the earth. Okay, that's Babylon in the end. All right, so let's look at this. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come up here. I will show you the judgment and doom of the great prostitute, which is the whore of Babylon or the harlot, who's seated on many waters. So remember, this is toward the latter part when it talks about the bowl judgments, right? But it says here, I will show you this great whore of Babylon, this, this great prostitute, if you will. That sits on many waters. So the waters speak of all these, you know, the mass of humanity all over the world. So this, this spirit, the whore of Babylon, which I think is the Jezebel spirit, but this spirit will have worldwide influence over great numbers of people of varying nations. And whether it be ethnic groups or religious groups, it's going to have widespread influence. It's a spiritual thing. Revelation 17 is, is the religious Babylon. It's the spiritual, it's the harlot church, okay? And it says this, she with whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality and the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated with the wine of her immorality. So in the Bible terms, immorality here speaks of idolatry and that's important because everybody's gonna think in their minds sex, something sexual. This is, this is deeper than that. It's idolatry. This is the way God speaks in his Bible. 
He is the creator. He is the one true God. And he wants to be worshipped as such. And he, his view is this. I have given the Bible to the world. I've given these Ten Commandments. And the first two in the Ten Commandments is do not create another God. And the second one, do not bow down and worship it. Yet, these people are going to bow down and worship other gods. And so he's saying here, they are unfaithful to me as the one true God. They are committing uh, adultery against me. They are unfaithful to my word. That's the way he views it. And so he says, the kings of the earth commit immorality and the inhabitants of the earth become intoxicated with the wine of her immorality. I mean, this is going to be a strong, deluding force in the earth. Now, mix it together with other scriptures I preach on regularly, River of Life, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Those that do not love the truth will be given over to a delusion. That's what's happening here. Okay, and it says, and the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now, Babylon seems to always be seen in the wilderness. If you read Jeremiah 50, Isaiah 13, etc. And it says, and I saw this woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was entirely covered with blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, the scarlet, when you think of red and you think of scarlet and you think of suffering, who do you think of? Jesus see this antichrist this man the antichrist is going to be a false Christ anti in the Greek means against but it also means instead of so he's going to be against Christ but he's also going to be Satan's replacement so he's a false Messiah if you will so he saw this woman though the whore of Babylon sitting on top of the beast so what this is without losing anybody the woman represents the religious it's like a strong seducing spirit of a a false religion and it's it's bringing all the religions together the false prophet is over this system and it's riding the beast the beast there that scarlet beast is the antichrist in his system and he's a politician. So the beast here is a political system. You can't help but think of Leviathan for those that are familiar with that. But it's got seven heads and ten horns. We already talked about the seven heads. Israel had seven major enemies. Egypt, Assyria, remember Babylon, Greece, and all that, all the way down. And this last system here, this Babylon, is going to be Israel's final great enemy but it's like all of the principalities of Egypt and Assyria and ancient Babylon, the Medes and Persians and all that. And it's like all those spiritual forces that were so anti-Israel and anti-Christ. Why is, why is the enemy trying to destroy Israel? Because Jesus is supposed to come back to Israel. That's what it's all about. It's about Jesus, not really Israel per se. And so all these spiritual forces that have tried to, to stop the coming of Jesus Christ and destroy the nation of Israel are all going to come together under the Antichrist. It's, it's, how many knows that we come and go, but these fallen angels don't? They're still around. So the same princes and powers that worked in ancient times are going to align themselves with the Antichrist. And then the ten heads are just ten like land masses all over Europe, and down in the Middle East and maybe other parts of the world, that there's going to be 10 specific kings, the Bible predicts, rulers over these 10 areas that will fully give their power to the Antichrist. And he's going to be really solidified. And so, see, they use each other. The Antichrist is a politician, but he's going to use the false prophet and the religious system to help him come to full power politically. So they help each other. And it's the same thing we've seen through the ages. Think about the Antichrist is going to be like a Pharaoh. And at the same time, Pharaoh had these really powerful sorcerers, these, these people that were occultists uh, that were served in his courts. And, I mean, they were powerful enough in the demonic realm to replicate, what was it, three or four of Moses' plagues. They even turned water to blood. They turned their staffs into snakes. So they had some power. And so the fault. So you see here how the Antichrist 
is also going to have his false prophet, which is a religious. So you're going to have politics and religion come together really powerfully. All right. And then it says this. She was riding this, this beast, the Antichrist. And it says the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls. She was holding in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and the filth of her sexual immorality or her idolatry, really. So the woman being dressed like this, have you ever thought about this? See, when I talk about a priesthood, everybody always thinks like Catholic or Eastern Orthodox every time, every time. But whenever I'm talking about a priesthood, I'm talking about the Bible priesthood under Aaron, okay? So if you go back, if, you, if you've never seen it before, Google this, find this, okay? But it's Aaron's priesthood. Look at the garments that Aaron wore. God gave this straight from heaven. There was a white layer of righteousness and salvation. There was a blue layer, which represents coming from heaven, the power of God. And it had the bells and pomegranates, the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. And then there was the golden ephod, which rested over the chest area, and it had precious stones on it. So let me, let me kind of rabbit trail just for a moment and give you something to think about. Did you know... Apparently, if you study this out, Lucifer, before he fell, had some kind of a priesthood of sorts. And let me explain it. It seems like to me, because he was an anointed cherub, he was a cherubim. He was not just a regular angel. And I think, in my opinion, the four living creatures and the cherubim are the same, okay? Satan probably the the cherubim were the ones that are right around the throne of god i mean even in the temple god told them when you make the ark which represents his throne and it's his dwelling place he said make sure and put the cherubim on the right and left there remember that in the ark in fact even when you were to go into the holy of holies what were there there were cherubim interwoven in the the veil so lucifer was one of those and it probably was something like this because the temple was a replica on the earth. God gave Moses the tabernacle. To, it was an exact replica of what was in heaven. So there's some type of a tabernacle temple in heaven that you go up like a hill to this temple. There's an outer court. There's a holy place. You can read it in Revelation. There's lampstands. And you go past that, and then there's the Holy of Holies is where God's throne is. And that's where you see like the cherubim and the seraphim around the throne. Satan at one time was an anointed cherub that covered. He was right there at the throne of God. The Bible says he walked among the fiery stones of God's throne itself. And Ezekiel bears out that he was created with tabrets and pipes, which means tabrets is like rhythms, like drum beats and rhythms. Pipes represents like melodies and chords. So he was some type of a worship leader. A, and then you see in there, it lists these nine stones. See, Lucifer only went up to number nine, which is now in the Bible means judgment. But his priesthood of leading worship and all that, he got, he got as he was leading worship to the Lord, he got lifted up with pride and it led to his demise. And he began to see himself as, why am, not, why am I not worshipped as God? And why can't I dethrone God and put myself in God's place? Sounds like what the Antichrist is going to do in the end. Remember that? So he, he ended up falling from heaven. But before he fell, he went through and he was, you can read this in the Hebrew, but he was slandering and gossiping against God to these angels. And he managed to get a third of them to follow him in his rebellion and he was thrown down out of heaven but what i want you to see is is that lucifer was like a priestly type of ministry it even associates him with some of those precious stones he he led worship in heaven apparently that's what it seems to indicate now he was cast down to the earth stripped of everything but lucifer even though he was stripped of his authority God had created him this way, so he still has this ability. Have you ever noticed whenever you mix under satanic influence out there, when you take something that is music-related 
and you mix it with a religious aspect to it, and it's some of that kind of satanic type of music, have you ever noticed that it has a real power in it and it's very bewitching? See, that goes all the way back to Lucifer's nature because that he's got music in him. Did you, have you ever thought about that? So when you start mixing uh, that music and, and, and this uh, weird ritualistic stuff and, and religious stuff that you see some of these weird artists are doing, it does have a power to it, okay? But I was going somewhere with that. So as Lucifer fell... All right, so God took out of heaven, gave Moses this replica of the tabernacle, gave him a priesthood, and look at this. This is like Lucifer's counterfeit. He said the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones. Look up Aaron's garments. This is a counterfeit. Now, the purple represents some type of royalty, and then it was it say scarlet that's a false see jesus is the suffering savior he's the one that is the true scarlet color does that make sense let me let me say it this way this might help colors in the bible are very symbolic so green and brown are earth but when you deal with heavenly you have first off you have white like white linen and it represents righteousness and salvation Jesus was revealed in that way in the Bible as the, the true righteous one in the book of Luke. Then you see Aaron was wearing the blue. Blue represents coming down from heaven. It's really on Aaron. It's a clothing of power from on high. It's, it represents the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The bells and pomegranates the, is the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. But blue represents heavenly. You notice here she has no blue. Jesus is revealed as the blue, okay, in the book of John, all right? And then you see also Aaron, and you, re you realize these colors, there's the color scarlet, okay? Scarlet is red, and Jesus is revealed as the suffering Savior in the book of Mark. And she's wearing scarlet, so it's a counterfeit, it's a false thing. And then uh, finally, purple. Purple is royalty. Jesus is revealed as the king of the Jews, the royal Messiah in the book of Matthew. So does this make sense tonight? So this is Satan's counterfeit religious priestly type of thing. And not only that, I wonder if this is speaking of something. Um, you know how, for example, here tonight, we dress pretty casual, but there are religious systems where the priesthood, where they're adorned with a lot of vestige. I, I just wonder, this is just me, I wonder if this isn't going to be like that. It's saying that there's going to be a false prophet who will look so religious, he'll be adorned in these special garments and precious stones and and he'll look so religious and he's going to have supernatural power i can show you in thessalonians where it says that the rise of the antichrist will be with all kinds of lying signs and wonders i can show you in revelation chapter 13 that the beast out of the earth now just follow me for a second the beast out of the earth is the false prophet and he had two horns like a lamb who's the lamb Jesus he looked like the lamb but he spoke like a dragon who's the dragon Satan the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing right here and look at this he exercises all authority of the first beast which is the Antichrist and he makes the earth and all the inhabitants worship the Antichrist whose deadly wound was healed and look at this he performs this is the false prophet he performs great signs even making fire fall from the sky to the earth right before people's eyes, and he deceives the inhabitants of the earth. So this is a very counterfeit thing, isn't it? You can see it in here as you read through it. And then it says, on her head, or her forehead, a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the great mother of prostitutes, or mother of harlots. And then in the Amplified, it puts in parentheses, false religions and heresies 
That's interesting. And of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints. Now remember Cain, his religion produced what? A murderer. So you think about all the way back from Cain down through all the ages, how many of God's people have been murdered? The prophets were murdered all through the ages. And, and then the book of Revelations indicates there's going to be a lot of martyrdom of God's people. And so this spirit here was drunk with the blood of the saints. Tremendous martyrdom. And with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus who were martyred, when I saw her, I wondered in amazement. But the angel said to me, why do you wonder? And I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast you saw, now this is probably going to lose you at first, but if you, I'll read it quickly and then explain it. But the beast you saw, this is the Antichrist, once was, but not right now, but it will come again. Up out of the abyss, out of the bottomless pit, the dwelling place here in, in the Amplify, the dwelling place of demons to go to destruction. So what does that mean? It was, it is not now, but it will be. In this day, remember, there was major enemies of Israel was Egypt, Assyria, then Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greece, and Rome. This was written in the days of Rome. What it's saying here was, this one was, it was Babylon. It's not now, but it will come again. So Babylon is going to reemerge again in the last days. I've wondered about this myself, just to throw this out, and you can think about it. And then I'm just going to read a little bit more of this. But whenever Saddam Hussein was in Iraq, he was fascinated with Nebuchadnezzar because Iraq was ancient Babylon, that land mass, okay? And so Nebuch I mean, uh, Saddam Hussein created these coins and all of his currency, you can look this up. It had his face on one side and Nebuchadnezzar on the other. I mean, Saddam Hussein was a very humble man, right? You know, <laughs> and he was just, just, I mean, fascinated with this Babylon. And he built all these elaborate palaces. Now, here's the interesting thing to me, because the Bible keeps saying here over and over and over, Babylon. I wonder about this, and I'll just give this to you. It may not be anything. But whenever America went in and dealt with Hussein, it cleared out his regime. But here's what happened after that. You remember that group ISIS that was real militant? They went through Iraq, and they either slaughtered or all of the Christians either fled that area completely or they were killed. There was a lot of martyrdom. How many remember seeing that on TV where they had all those martyrs? That was... So Iraq has been kind of completely sanitized of anything to do with God whatsoever. Well, here's the interesting thing. That's the landmass is ancient Babylon. I wonder if the Antichrist won't set up some type of a, a headquarters or something there eventually. He may not. And I wonder if maybe he won't have something in the way of calling his system something Babylon. I don't know. But I'm going to skip down to verse 14 because it's going to get too complicated if I keep going with that. But it says, they will wage war against the Lamb, against Christ, and the Lamb will triumph and conquer them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And the angel said, the waters that you saw, the prostitute on are the nations, okay, many people. And then it says that the ten horns, which is those kings, the ten kings that serve the Antichrist, they will hate the prostitute, this is the religious system. They're going to hate this religious system and will make her desolate and naked and the Amplified, stripped of her power and influence, will eat her flesh and completely consume her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by agreeing together to surrender their kingdom to the beast, the Antichrist, until the prophetic words of God are fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over and dominates and controls the kings and political leaders. You're going to see a few more things. Okay, I should read a little bit more. Is this interesting to some people? This is what I felt led to do tonight is look at Revelation, okay? And Jackson loves Revelation. He's very focused at the moment. And so Babylon has fallen. So verse eight or chapter 18 is now the political. So 17 is the religious. 18 is now the political. 
So it says here in Revelation 18, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority. The earth was illuminated with splint, his splendor and radiance. And he shouted with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit, and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. Now if you read Jeremiah 50 and Isaiah 13 at the fall of Babylon, it references this. In fact, Isaiah 13 references that it's a wilderness and it's a haunt for like demonic spirits. It calls them wild beasts there though. And it says, all the nations have drunk the wine of her passion of her immorality, idolatry, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich and wealthy. So here's the interesting thing here. Because now we're looking at a political, a geopolitical scene here. But the merchants have come. So apparently, somehow people were getting rich off of this system. It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. Let me just warn you. When God sends judgment on certain sins... No matter if you go to church or not, if you call yourself a Christian or not, if you're participating in those sins, when judgment comes on those sins, it's going to fall on everybody participating in those sins. And the Lord's saying here, get out of this system. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness. He said, I will repay even as she has repaid others and pay her back double the torment. To the degree that she has glorified herself and reveled and gloated in her sensuality. And it says, living deliciously and luxuriously. To the same degree imposed on her torment and anguish, mourning and grief. For her, her, her heart boast, I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow and will never ever see mourning or experience grief. For this reason, in a single day, her plagues will come. Pestilence and mourning and famine, she will be burned up with fire, completely consumed for strong and powerful is the Lord who judges her. And look at this. It's really interesting. I'll explain some of this. Um, so here's, here's how this is going to happen. The Antichrist is going to use this religious system, the false prophet in this religious system, to help him come to political power. But once he comes to power, one of the main things he's going to do is he's going to sign a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. The Knesset, the prime minister, those of influence in Israel are going to sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist eventually. When they do that, I believe it will have to do with them being able to finish the temple, get it back or whatever, and they're going to be able to start the, the sacrificial system again, okay? And once they start this sacrificial system, it's going to continue for three and a half years but in the middle of that time, that seven-year peace treaty, right in the middle, the Antichrist is going to hate that religious system. And he's going to bomb it. And I'm going to show you some things here. But he's going to, him and these ten kings are actually, I believe, it seems to say, are actually going to bomb the religious center. And the smoke of it's going to rise up. And I'm going to show it to you here. But once he destroys this religious system, he burns it. He's going to bomb it, destroy it. Then he's no longer using this religious system the way it was. Now he's going to sit himself in the temple on a throne with his image, and he's going to command everybody to worship him as God. So no longer does he want this religious system. Now he says, do away with it, because now I want everybody worshiping me as God. And it's a counterfeit. You've got... Lucifer, like a counterfeit father. You got him as a counterfeit Christ, and then you've got the false prophet as a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Is this making sense? And let me finish this real quick. It says, And the kings and political leaders of the earth who committed immorality and lived luxuriously with her will weep and beat their chest in mourning over her when they see the smoke of her burning. This, to me, speaks of some kind of like a nuclear bomb. And let me show you. They're going to see the smoke of her burning coming up, standing a long way off for fear of the torment. Why would somebody stand a far way off after a bomb? Radiation. 
It says, they're going to say, woe, woe to the great city, the strong city Babylon. And in a single hour, your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth, what's the merchants? These are people that are buying and selling and getting extremely wealthy off of all this. It says they got cargoes of gold and silver, precious stones. And I'm not going to read it all, but it's every extravagant thing you could imagine. And they're weeping and mourning over this great loss. And it says in verse 19, they're going to throw dust on their heads and cry out weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, for the great city where all the ships at sea grew rich and had great wealth because in one hour she has laid waste. But it says, Rejoice, O heaven, you saints, God's people, the apostles and prophets who were martyred, because God has executed vengeance for you through his righteous judgment upon her. In a single, then a single powerful angel picked up a boulder and threw it, flung it into the sea, saying, With such violence, Babylon the great will be hurled down and destroyed. So I just want to stop there. But you see here the destruction of this religious system. All right. Is all this making sense? I didn't lose anybody tonight. So... <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> just a second. You're seeing here a religious system and a political system that Satan will inhabit that's going to be extremely powerful. And when it comes together, it's going to be very antichrist. It's going to persecute anything to do with God. Now, why is this important that I share this? Because the Bible says, come out of her, my people. So apparently there's going to be a warning for us to not be a part of this system. And now that I look at this today, we see that there's been so many different things creeping into the church world, even in recent years, that it is actually astonishing that it has crept in. I mean, I think about the Methodist church, which is splitting because some of them are ordaining homosexuals. And, of course, most of them can't stand that, and they're splitting, it's splitting them. And so those that are going, in the days to come, those that are going to become increasingly tolerant in four things that God is clearly against, they are the ones that are going to be a part of the harlot church. And the further you go down in that darkness, the thicker the deception will become until people are completely given over. I mean, you have to understand, I would have never thought in a million years that a lot of things would be acceptable like it is today. A lot of things, not just some things. There was a sense of holiness and the fear of God and an awe of God back when I was growing up that people knew certain things were to be avoided. And, and there was a, a, you know, there were standards. I mean, you just knew it. But now it's like an anything goes type of mentality. And I'm telling you, you're going to be shocked should the Lord this happened pretty soon and i suspect that it's not far off whenever you start seeing these things and you start seeing the mark of the beast come you're going to be surprised how many people that you would have never thought would take it will take it sellouts but see the reason why is because of the pressure and people people need to get really serious about their walk with god okay so Nadab and Abihu, Ananias and Sapphira. Let me give you this. I'm going to close with a little bit here. So when God instituted the priesthood under Moses and Aaron, Aaron had four sons, but they, two of them didn't take the warnings seriously. And Nadab and Abihu, two sons of Aaron, went into the Holy of Holies burning incense and celebrating before the Lord, and it was against the word of God. And fire came out from the Holy of Holies and consumed them. And it was sad, but at the same time, it brought a fear, a necessary, important fear of God to come. That God said, do not do that, and people did it. And so there was consequences. Then, in the days of the early church, how many remember reading about Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, God was moving mightily. I mean, Peter, Peter was seeing such miracles that... That as they walk through praying for people, even his shadow passing over people, people are getting healed. And Paul was seeing such miracles, handkerchiefs and aprons that simply came to him, he prayed over, was sent out, and people are having all kinds of miracles and healings. It's a time of great revival, but Ananias and Sapphira, there was different needs coming up financially, and so people were selling something they owned. They felt the Lord was coming soon, and so they... They were selling things they owned, and they were taking the money laying at the apostles' feet, 
and the apostles were distributing it out where it's needed, while Ananias and Sapphira lied about it. That they had sold everything and they, they were trying to look good outwardly and they lied to God. And the Bible says that Peter asked them, said, why are you lying to the Lord? And they, they both, independent of each other, but they both dropped dead and they had to take him out and bury him. But it says that the fear of God came upon the people. And that was important. I know that nobody wants something like that to happen, but it's like there was a good, healthy fear of God that came on the people. And the people knew, wait a second, God's among us. We need to live fearfully before the Lord and live righteously. There's a good fear of God, amen? And so Jesus himself taught us, he said, don't fear whenever um, Herod was threatening or whatever. And Jesus said, who is this old fox Herod? But he said, don't fear him who can just kill you, but fear the one who can kill you and then throw you into hell. Fear him. So there's a good, healthy fear of God that Jesus Christ himself taught. And then the Bible says in Isaiah about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom. Well, first off, the spirit of the Lord, number one. Then wisdom, revelation, counsel, might, knowledge, and what? The fear of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit comes in his fullness, he comes in all those attributes, but one of them is the fear of the Lord. And it says about Jesus in Isaiah, it says he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So there is a healthy, good fear of God. So let me read a few more scriptures, and then we're going to pray about the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what righteousness and lawlessness what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? What does light have in common with darkness? And what harmony does Christ have with Belial, which means lawless? What does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. For God has said, I will dwell among them. So when people realize that God really is among us, that should put a good, healthy fear of God. Because then we realize we can't just do or say anything. Because God is with us, among us. He said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. Says the Lord, do not touch what's unclean and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 6. Then it goes on to say in the next verse, 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from any defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. And then, of course, the famous scripture in Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and of the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who ignored the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit? For we know him who says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people, his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So what I'm getting at is, see, when revival comes, there's a holiness and there's a fear of God that begins to deal with us. But I'm just warning people, that for all of us, we better get serious about our faith. If we know that there's things that we need to repent of, it's time to repent of it. If we know there's relationships that we don't need in our life, if we know there's places we don't need to be hanging out at, if we know there's things that we don't need to be listening to or watching, whatever it is that we know deep down does not please God, we better start dealing with it. There's all these promises. I, I have them in the notes. I'm going to put these up on the Internet. If you go to sermon.net, you can get the notes. But um, it has all the Scripture references. But think about this for a minute. For those that fear the Lord, I'm going to read them fast, but the fear of the Lord, God promises this. It's a preparation for leadership. God promises special protection, receiving honor, receiving wealth and riches, 
God will confide in you and tell you his secrets. His eye will be upon you. There'll be no lack. You will be delivered. You'll be shown mercy. You'll have, God will have compassion on you. He'll provide food for you. He'll fulfill your desires. He will take pleasure in you. God will bless you and your children. God will bless you with many children around your table. We will find acceptance from the Lord. He will store up goodness for you. God will teach you in the way he's chosen for you. The Lord will hear, hear you when you cry out to him and save you. It says God will prolong your days. You'll have strong confidence in the Lord. He will give you a fountain of life. You will be satisfied. You will not be visited with evil. You will prosper. Things will go well for you. You will be rewarded. You will receive wisdom. God will give you life and peace. God will write about you in his book of remembrance. And you will, he will come to you with healing in his wings. That's several promises that specifically are for those that fear the Lord. Every one of them I can give you a scripture reference. For sake of time, I don't have time to do it. But the Bible promises to those that fear the Lord, those things would be yours. So I'm saying all that tonight to say this. There's a coming out from among them and being holy. And so as revival is about to come, I believe God has a door that's going to open. I believe when it comes, there's going to be a move of the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come and with a fear of God, a conviction. Okay, when he does, people are going to be gripped with conviction again. They're going to be repenting. But let me just warn you, because I've seen this, people need to really take it serious and get everything dealt with between them and God. Because I saw people when revival waned, some people began to go back to some old things. How many knows we need to really get clean and stay clean? Amen. Start living a holy life. We change the way we think. We change the way we talk. We change the way we act. I mean, when you're really, truly the Lord's, people can look at you and they can see that you're different. You act different. You think different. You speak different. You dress different. I mean, it's not a legalistic thing. It's just that you're the Lord's and you're not like the people of the world anymore. There's a difference. And in the days to come, this is what I, I foresee. I foresee that religion of Cain that produced a murderer is going to keep increasing. You're going to see more and more of a hatred of God's true people. How many have already seen, at least in your lifetime, even some of you that are quite young, you've already seen how God's people are hated sometimes for no good reason? He knows. We've seen it. Hated for no good reason, except that they're of Cain. They're a part of that Cain system. They have a form of religiousness about them, but they're murderers. They they're, they're belong to the enemy. They're tares. They're not gods. And they, 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 something in them hates the true people of God. You're going to see that increase, but you're also going to see God's people get increasingly radical, sold out, holy. The glory is going to increase. God's going to be with us in a greater measure. In fact, we're going to see revival and we're going to see a harvest. And it's going to be supernatural. I mean, there's going to be people, you mark my word, and you remember this, that Pastor, one of these days you're going to say, Pastor, I remember you saying that. There's going to be people wander in wherever we are. We won't be here. We'll be another place. There's going to be people wander in and get saved. And you'll ask them later, well, how'd you get here? And they say, I have no idea. I just wandered in here. Something drew me in here. I was driving down the road and something told me to stop. Things like that. It's a supernatural harvest. You understand that? It's not something intellectual. It's something where the Holy Spirit just draws in people to Christ. It's going to be a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, as we close this out tonight, we'll pray for people. Maybe we can spend some time in some intercession and prayer. We'll pray for those that want prayer. But this is the time. If you need to get anything right with God, please don't put it off. Can you come up on the keyboard for a minute? Just turn it way down. Just play something really soft. Maybe Lord have mercy. But listen, I want people to take a moment where you're at. You can just go to a screen or whatever, but I'm talking to those online too. Please take a moment.